In Uganda now, where art was given special recognition at the Venice Biennial as the prestigious exhibition opened this weekend in Italy. Uganda was represented at Venice for the first time. Its pavilion shows the works of Akaye Kerunin, who collaborates with craftswomen from different parts of the country to create her pieces, and Colin Shekajugo, whose paintings manipulate stock images. Kerunin was delighted to receive the recognition and said it came at a, as a huge surprise. It's a very historic moment. Uganda is again in the limelight for the right reasons. The jury said that the special mention to Uganda was in acknowledgement of their vision, ambition and commitment to art and working in their country. Akaya Kerunin in her choice of sculptural materials like back cloth, raffia and illustra illustrations, I beg your pardon, sustainability as practice and not just a policy or concept. Still in Uganda, authorities say they have detained a Congolese national found transporting 122 African grey parrots in the western district of Kizoro. The suspect was arrested with the birds crammed into two cages during a joint operation by the police, the Uganda Wildlife Authority and the Army. Uganda Wildlife Authority spokesman Bashir Hangai said they acted following a tip-off that parrots were being smuggled from Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, to Uganda. Meanwhile, three parrots had died when the man was arrested in Kibaya village near the border town of Bugana. The suspect is now being held at the central police station in Uganda's capital, Kampala. Reports say the parrots have been taken to the Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Center, adding that African grey parrots, native to rainforests in Central Africa, are listed as an endangered species by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN. To health now where the World Health Organization says it has identified 100 more people who came in contact with a new case of the Ebola virus in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It said they were being closely monitored for symptoms with vaccinations to start in the next few days. Over the weekend, the health authorities declared the third Ebola outbreak in Ikota province since 2018. DR Congo has experienced 14 outbreaks which have claimed thousands of lives. Meanwhile, a plan to reintroduce Reno species to the Zinhev National Park in southern Mozambique, which became extinct 40 years ago, has been announced by the governments of Mozambique and South Africa. The governments approved the reintroduction of more than 40 rhinos to the specially constructed high security sanctuary within 4,000 square meters park. The rhinos will be translocated from South Africa over a period of one to two years. Meanwhile, the project to bring in the critically endangered black rhino and the near-threatened white rhino to the park is being spearheaded by the South African non-governmental organization Peace Parks Foundation and the Exaro Resources Company, which is a coal and mining firm. According to reports, in 2002, Mozambique, South Africa and Zimbabwe entered into a treaty to establish the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Conservation Area, spanning over 100,000 square meters and incorporating five national parks, including the iconic Krunga National Park. In another development, the chairman of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki Mohamed, has held a phone conversation with Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Laru Faki. Faki posted on Twitter that he stressed the need to respect international law and urged for dialogue and a peaceful resolution to the war in Ukraine. The conflict has led to sharp increases in fuel and rent prices in Africa and threatens to further worsen economics economies 
devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. It could be recalled that last week, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky reached out to his Senegalese counterpart and African Union Chairman Marky Sol, requesting to address the AU. To Mozambique now, where a man has been arrested in Mozambique central Zambezia province after being accused of decapitating a young girl whom he thought was his daughter. Police, police spokesman Cynthia Lonzo said the man and his wife were having a bitter argument when the wife told him he was not the child's biological father. As furious as he was, he ended up committing the crime. Away from that, Ethiopia's athletics body has sent its condolences to the family and friends of Kenyan-born athlete Damaris Muthihi Mutua, 28-year-old, after she was found dead with stab wounds in the Kenyan town of Eton, famous for its center for long-distance runners. Police say her Ethiopian boyfriend, Eskinda Hail Mary, was a key suspect and that they were looking for him, adding that Mutua's body was found in a state of decomposition in Eten. The Ethiopian Athletics Federation described Mutua as a heroine athlete. Reports say she was born in Kenya but has competed for Berhen, adding that she is the second female athlete to be killed in the town in a year. So security matters now where violent clashes have spread to Janina, the capital of Sudan's West Darfur state, after at least 168 people were reportedly killed on Sunday in Krinik, 80 kilometers away. According to non-governmental organizations, the Krinik violence was caused by an individual dispute sparked by the fightings between Arab nomads and members of the Masalit community. Many of those fleeing the southern neighbor neighborhoods of Jinina have already been displaced in the past three years. Meanwhile, many panicking families were trying to run to safety as they left their huts and tents in internally displaced people's IDP camps in southern parts of the city. Meanwhile, United Nations peacekeeping mission in South Sudan, UNMIS, says at least 72 civilians were killed, including some who were burnt alive and decapitated in the northern Lier County. UNMIS condemned what it's called the widespread sexual violence, killings including beheadings, burning alive of civilians and attacks on humanitarians in the Lier County. According to Nicholas Haysom, who is the special representative of the Secretary General for South Sudan and head of UNMIS on Monday. In a press release, over 40,000 people were reportedly forced to flee their homes. Meanwhile, these are amongst the human rights violations documented during a surge in violence carried out by armed youth from Koch and Mehindit counties. Reports say two survivors of the attacks were repeatedly raped after they came out of hiding to find food for their children. It could be recalled that last week President Salva Kiir formed a committee to investigate the causes of the violence which occurred between 17 February and 7 April. Elsewhere, a trial has begun in Germany of a Gambian man accused of being part of death squad that assassinated opponents of the West African country's former president, Yahai Jame. The defendant, Bay Lowy, is accused of crimes against humanity and murder, including the killing of a journalist, Deheda Hydra, 18 years ago. Lowy, 46, has previously confessed to being a driver with the hit squad known as the Junglers, which reportedly directly to Jame. Reports say the trial is taking place on the basis of universal jurisdiction, which allows a foreign country to prosecute crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide, regardless of where they were committed. To 
Tanzania now, where the founder of Tanzania's Umoja Party says they have decided to use the portrait of the late President John Mugulifi on their T-shirts because their policies resonate with those of the former leader. Former President Mugulifi died in March last year. The party has submitted an application for registration to the Registrar of Political Parties who wanted to stop engaging in political activities without being a registered entity yet. The social media is awash with pictures of people alleged to be followers of Umoja Party wearing t-shirts with the flag of the party and a picture of Magulfuli. Speaking to newsmen recently, the party founder, Shaiv Malim, says they have used Mangulufi's image to popularize their party. He said they do not have bad intentions by using the photograph of the late Magufuli, who is not their member, but that they have done that to market themselves to the public. Adding that their policies relate with that, what Magufuli was standing for. Meanwhile, Malim said he believes that the office of the registrar will write to them indicating the party's mistakes and where they have erred in order to make amends, saying they are not against the guidelines of the registrar. Meanwhile, rival government in Libya has held its first meeting in the latest challenge to the unbacked administration based in the capital Tripoli. Since February, Libya has again been split between two opposing cabinets after parliament in the east elected Fatih Banshaga as the new prime minister, while the incumbent Abdulhamid Dehiba refused to step down. At the first session of his cabinet in the southern town of Sheba, Bashaga declared that a new era was beginning in Libya after chaos and tyranny. But there is widespread concern that the country could face new unrest after the UN-sponsored political roadmap was cast into doubt by the failure to hold planned elections in December. To Kenya now, where wildlife authorities say they have had to intervene to save some wild animals affected by a prolonged drought in parks and other areas in the country. The Kenya Wildlife Service, KWS, says it has been drilling boreholes and filling water pans after water sources, including seasonal rivers, dried up. It has also been providing wild animals with food supplements, such as hay, in some parks. Veterinary doctors have been moving around the parks to identify sick and weak animals to treat them, as well as conducting post-mortem on carcasses. It, however, says that the significant rainfall in Kenya over the last few days will be a relief for many ha herbivores that have been affected by lack of water and foliage. We'll take a quick break and when we return, we will bring you more stories on Spotlight Africa. Thanks for staying tuned. Now on over to Africa on the rise. AMREF Health Africa has shown that indigenous solutions based on international science can address the toughest problems in the world and serve as a beacon for Africa and for the world. The Global Health Fund, AMREF Health Africa, has almost 60 years experience in health development. In 1957, three surgeons, Sir Michael Wood, Archibald Minchindo, and Thomas Rees, founded the Flying Doctor Service of East Africa, a foundation that would later become one of the continent's most respected health development organizations. AMREF Health Africa earns its respect through being Africa born and Africa based. Their staff work hand in hand with their communities to better their quality of life as they strive together to build a bright future for the continent. Respected by peer NGOs, 
research institutes and governments for its community and evidence-based approach. AMREF Health Africa partners with institutions such as the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Harvard and John Hopkins universities and medical institutes throughout the continent to achieve its goal. The foundation also receives substantial financial support from governments including Canada, Sweden, UK and the USA. For our spotlight personality for today, Akaye Kerunian. Akaye Kerunian is a multidisciplinary performance and installation artist, storyteller, writer, actress and activist based in Kampala, Uganda. She graduated with a BSc in Mass Communication from the Islamic University in Uganda, Mbale, and obtained a diploma in Information Systems Management from Aptec. Akaye was the assistant director on the Volcano Theatre production of Goodness in Canada in 2012 and is the founding director of Cable Theatre. In 2012, Vogue Italia magazine featured her as one of the social activists Africa should watch closely. Since a young age, Akaya has also been an actress and has performed in productions such as Silent Voice by Judith Andong, her poetry and musical theatre, which was published under the same title in 2006, Dawn of the Pearl, have received public performances at the National Theatre in Uganda and the Phoenix Theatre in Kenya. Launching her career as a director, producer, composer, Akaye has written stories for publications including the Ministry of Education, Banyiba Productions and Frame Bright Uganda. She also writes for various online and print media, both locally and internationally. Raised by her single mother, who was also an artist, shaped her worldview to become woman conscious. The maternal values transferred from her mother are evident in Akaya's work ethics, which involves multitude collaborations with women. Some in transition from domestic violence, poverty or internal displacement to women who are struggling to find outlets for their inherent creativity. And that's all we have for you at this time. Do ensure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our 